In this video, I'm going to chat about some of the biases that I think I have. And there are a lot of different biases. There's the confirmation bias. That's a big one. And that is when you, you kind of believe something, you have this certain worldview, and then you look for evidence to confirm it. And it's all over the place. If you really think that those dang Mexicans coming across the border, some of them are felons and and have done all manner of horrible things, and they just come right over, and we can't let that happen. If you believe that, then that's the information you're going to hear. And every two million immigrants that come across the government border, uh, you'll find one out of those million that some horrible criminal, you'll say, see, there they go. They're all coming over here. Well, that's kind of the confirmation bias. And there are a lot of other biases. And it's worth looking at biases. Uh, look at the top uh, top ones, the most popular ones that, that we, we mess up on. And kind of think about how you live and, and, and how you think and how are those biases affecting you. And so I'm going to talk about myself a bit. Uh, that's that's the kind of topic of this video is, is telling you more about me and how I probably came to have some of the biases that I have. I'm spending a lot of time and energy and thought getting rid of my biases, being a clear thinker, uh, an honest thinker. And it's sometimes difficult because of the good and the bad and the, the medium experiences that I've been through. And so we'll kind of start with, with poverty. I was reared in what I think a lot of people would call abject poverty. Now, this isn't developing world poverty. This is United States in the 1970s and 80s poverty, which wasn't as bad. Uh, for a number of years, I would say from age two until 15, 16 years old, we lived very poor. Actually, I'm going to move that up to 18 years old. Uh, for much of the time, my mother was on food stamps. And I'm not sure if it's the same thing, but something AFDC, I think it's something like that. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure what the exact amounts were. But I recall something like $187 from one of these government welfare checks and $206 or $208 from another one. And that was our income. Well, why didn't my mom go out and just work, get a job and work? Yeah, now as a with my current worldview, yeah, I kind of agree that that might have been a better idea. On the other hand, her big thought was she chose to be a mother a single mother, and she, she did actually choose to be a single mother. She was responsible for this child, me, and she took it very seriously, and she was happy to work, and she did work jobs off and on when she could find them, but the stipulations were she had to see me off to school, to a little private Mennonite school, and then she had to be home when I got out of school. And now there were other times that she would she would work some jobs that didn't do that for a while. I recall going for a while to the uh, uh, Aaron Bauman's parents, uh, Magdalena and Josh Bauman. Uh, they've both uh, died since, but uh, I would go and she would kind of take me in and and we would. Uh, I think it was midnight or so that mom would get off work at the sewing factory and uh, then come pick me up. Uh, and, and so she, she did do some work, but there were a lot of years that she didn't work outside of the home. And being poor, being on welfare, and trying to survive that way. Now, for me, it wasn't trying to survive. It was just normal life. I was a kid. I didn't know any better. But a couple things kind of stood out. I recall once some family friends, uh, the guy's parents, had bought a just an investment property they weren't going to do anything with, had this old dilapidated house on it. And they're like, yeah, uh, you guys can live there. And I remember as we were moving in, they kind of met us there to show us around. And they gave this whole condescending spiel about, you know, we've just been very fortunate and we're happy when we can help other people who are having a tough time. And, and we just had to listen and smile to it. And it was so demeaning. It, it was so, you know, you, you feel that tall. Uh, that that sucked. 
I recall another time at a grocery store, I think in Jamestown, Tennessee, that when we went up to pay, my mom asked me to walk ahead kind of to the entrance lobby area while she paid just so that I wouldn't have to experience the embarrassment of the food stamps. And back then it wasn't one of those credit card looking things. It was actual paper food stamps. And she felt that small. And and maybe she should have. Um, she's taking welfare and the money wasn't coming from somebody who said, you know, I like the idea of, of people who choose to be single moms, not having to work and to be there 100% dedicating their lives to their children. And I want to fund them and their children. If that's where the money had come from, then I, I might have a motivation work ethic problem. But actually, that's a value difference. Uh, yeah, I don't think I'd blame my mom for if that money had come from a, a, a honest place, not from stolen government tax theft. Uh, if that had come from an honest place, I, I, I guess I wouldn't have that much of a problem with it. But it didn't. And so we, we had some poverty. Uh, I recall one time my mother also was a cigarette smoker. And she would roll her own cigarettes. Uh, kite? Tobacco, I think. Was was kite the tobacco or was that the, the rolling paper? I'm not sure, but um, she'd have it was in a can. I think a greenish-blue can, as I recall. Uh, and she ran out once. And at this point, we were living in an old abandoned house that the, the people were letting us live in. No electricity. I think the closest place electricity would have been would have been a, a mile from it or so. Uh, so no electricity, no running water. There was a pump uh, that you could go and do the, the hand pump thing to fill up the the old empty milk jugs or a stainless steel bucket, uh, and, you know, go to the bathroom in a uh, outhouse. That was a, a really rough kind of place. Uh, anyway, uh, it was it was it was great. I mean, I had great time walking around as a two or three year old at that point. I think, and I, I have a few memories, not that many from that age, but a, a few memories. I recall once we were out of tobacco. I say we because we were a family unit. We were out of tobacco and rolling paper also. And so we walked, two years old I was at the time, and I'm sure mom carried me part of the way. We went, oh, two, no, three, four miles away to the nearest little store to try to get some tobacco. And it was just an occasionally open room off of somebody's house. And it turns out they didn't have tobacco or they weren't open or something like that. So we were walking back and there wasn't that solution. And it just so happened, like crazy awesome coincidence, that part of the way back, my grandmother who lived three hours away on Douglas Lake, which is near Sevierville, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, she happened to be coming for a visit and was driving and saw us and stopped and picked us up. So that saved us two or three miles of a walk. And I recall that until we went out to a store, my mom tried rolling tea. She got some tea leaves and rolled them in newspaper and tried smoking them. And I'm not sure, I don't know that much about chemistry or about ink and inhaling it and tea and such, but from what she said, that wasn't a, that wasn't a very good substitute for a real tobacco cigarette. Uh, but there are a few things like that that were pretty poor. Uh, we lived in, in pretty poor conditions, and I was never hungry, uh, you know, never ever. Um, we always had some sort of food. Um, I recall one of the biggest treats. This was years later. Um, we still lived in the Mennonite community, but we were attending a Seventh-day Adventist church, and we would go in there, and then afterward, we would go to the uh, Kroger's grocery store in Cookville, and we would go and, and do our shopping for the, the week or two weeks. And the treat, when we could afford it, it wasn't every time, but uh, my mom would buy a box of Triscuits and some salami, some hard salami. And we'd get into the car and we'd cut the salami circles into quarters. And they wouldn't quite cover the the Triscuit, but we cut it into quarters so it would last longer and then put it on the Triscuit and eat that Triscuit with salami on it. And that was the greatest luxury, the greatest treat. That was such a, oh, that felt good. I mean, 
the idea of going out to a restaurant at that point, even like, a, I don't know if Denny's existed at that time. I know, was it Shoney's Big Boy or something like that? Uh, I remember I went there with somebody else. But, I mean, we wouldn't go there or a fast food or like that kind of stuff was just so far out of our, uh, what we could afford. It just, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but that, that Triscuit with salami, that was a big treat. And so that was, that was just a few things that, that stand out in my memory. You know, driving past the big houses, my mom would later tell me that even as a little tiny kid, I would look as we're driving by at the big, huge houses. I always wanted that. Um, I always would look at motorcycles. I liked motorcycles, so I'd stare at those even as a two- or three-year-old kid. And, of course, at this point, we couldn't afford our own car. But if we got a ride with somebody else to town to, to do our grocery shopping or whatever... Uh, I, I would look at those, and I always had that yearning uh, for for those things and, and a few other things. Um, I recall once when I was 13 or 14, there was a neighbor uh, guy from five, six miles away. I think I met him through a Baptist church. We would hop around. We were mainly in the Mennonite circles, but also Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, kind of hop around a bit. But I met this kid. He was a, uh, he, he was English. He wasn't a plain person. He was from a uh, mainstream hillbilly family, but he had a four wheeler, and I remember I, I still I have a picture of me sitting on that four wheeler, and he gave me a ride on it. I got to ride behind him, and oh my gosh, that was just so exciting and awesome. Always dreamed of that. And so those are uh, those are again a, a few examples of the the things I used to want for the the poverty that I was reared in, and so one might think that now, years later, my bias would be to help poor people by giving them money for food and an ATV, a four-wheeler, um, meals out at restaurants, uh, big houses, motorcycles, the things that, t tobacco, cigarettes, the things that we wanted for but didn't have because of a lack of, of money. One might think that that would be my bias, that I would be a strong proponent of let's help the poor people by giving them the things that they want, but that they haven't acquired through free market means. But that's not, that's not where I come down on things. I'm actually very much different than that. I think we each make choices in life, and we make these choices, and then we have to live by them. And my mother had some values that were different than my current values. My current values are make money and, you know, let the, let whomever rear your kids, but you're out, you got to go out and make money. My mom had the polar opposite of that. And I don't know which is right or if there's balance, if there's a proper work-life balance as uh, the world NGOs would like us to believe uh, that we should only work 40 hours a week. And buy, I, I don't know. I don't know what's true or right, but those are some of my biases about poverty. Let's chat about some of my biases that uh, have to do with the initiation of violence against others. I think uh, probably my first experience that I remember, that I consciously remember, was Adam Turtle, who lived in Tennessee. He had a, a farm, and I think he he's still some sort of a a farmer influencer kind of dude. He's old, old guy now. Found another gal, but uh, he, he's an old dude at this point. Um, so I, I'm not, you know, trying to bring him down. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm going to be completely honest, and it's okay that the world knows who he is. Uh, my mother was dating him for a while, and she, he was one of two guys that my mom dated between uh, age eight months and 18 years. And even after that, she never dated anybody. Uh, she just didn't think it was proper uh, for, you know, her to be going out with guys. She had a little baby kid and it just, you know, unless there was a probability it was going to lead to something serious, eh, it wasn't worth doing. So Adam Turtle was one guy who she, she did date. I was three, four years old, not sure which. And I recall once they had just broken up and, and we would do sleepovers at his house. And it was way out in the country on his farm. They'd just broken up this one rainy night and we were outside. I remember there's mud all over the ground and they were arguing 
And this stood out to me because that wasn't something I was used to. It was interpersonal conflict, yelling, raised voices. We didn't do that in our home. And he grabbed her at one point by the hair and threw her down onto the ground. And, and I recall it was right beside a car. She had evidently gotten a hold of somebody who came to pick her up. I, I recall it being a woman, but I don't remember who. But the other car was there. And Adam grabs her by the hair, throws her down. I'm just a little kid standing there. I don't remember what my emotions were, but now I'm thinking they were just kind of like, whoa, what was that? And we got in the car and drove away. So that was my first introduction to the initiation of violence, the blatant, open, physical initiation of violence. And then I recall later, probably, uh, God, what would this have been? I'm thinking... Uh, my second family violence, domestic violence thing that I saw was at about age third grade. What would that be? Eight or nine years old in Grimsley, Tennessee. We were visiting some friends and looking across the field, there was a, the next house, uh, probably 150, 200 yards away. <laughs> Chris is a kid. You always never get sized right, but uh, I think that's how far it was. Uh, we were looking out there and the guy was yelling at his wife. And he had a shotgun out there, and he was pointing it at her, and and then he throws it in the back seat of the car. He grabs her and slams her head on the hood of the car, and just yelling and cussing, and and we're hovering in the house. The the woman who lived there, you know, grabbed her revolver just so she, in case the guy came over, she'd have something. And I don't recall if anybody in our household called the cops or not. Maybe at that point it was kind of like, well you know, shame on him, but that's that family's business. I, I don't know what, well, I don't know the behind the scenes stuff. I was, you know, eight, nine years old. And so I, I recall that happening and just being really, wow, that ain't real cool. And, and that's, that's just sick and wrong, man. Uh, didn't care for that at all. Uh, and then as I got older, I don't think there was really uh, much violence. I, I moved to the hood. We, we, we went to Morristown, Tennessee. And we lived in the bad part of town at the time in some projects, some housing projects. Radio Center, something like that. I think that that neck of the woods was called. And it was, it was you know, brick buildings, projects. And after being there for a few weeks or a month or whatever, I got in a fight with one of the, the neighborhood boys. And, oh, he won. Like, I guess he was the, the heavy in the neighborhood. Um, I don't know anything about this stuff. Like at that point, I had no clue, zero clue. Like, like, why is this guy who I've been buddies with and we ride bikes together? Why is he all of a sudden like talking mean to me and wanting to fight? And there are a group of boys standing around and we go at it and we're bloody. And like, why'd that just happen? <laughs> um, but I remember that violence. And, and then I, afterward, the guy was explaining to me that that now, because not that guy, but another neighborhood boy was saying that I guess I was number three in the neighborhood because for some reason I didn't kick this guy's butt, but I could kick the other guy's butt and therefore nobody was going to challenge it. So I was number three in, I don't know, something like that. Um, but that was one of my other few you know, rare introductions to violence. Uh, and then it wasn't until I was much older that I faced any real violence or, or participated in it. I remember when I was 17 or so, I was on a ride along. I was very interested in becoming a police officer. And I was on a ride along and the officer and I, who still a good buddy, we actually went ATVing about three weeks ago. Uh, so that's been a long 35 years, something like that, close, 33, 34 years. Anyway, uh, I was on a ride along with him, and we were uh, arresting this drunk guy. Of course, I'm supposed to stand back. I'm just a teenage kid on a ride along. But the cop ends up getting in a wrestling match with a guy. And I remember he had Twizzlers, red Twizzlers, that he was chewing on until we started our tussling, trying to arrest him for being drunk in public or whatever. And And so... My buddy is wrestling with him, but could use a hand. So I get down there too. And fortunately, I had attended a few weeks of Taekwondo and I knew what to do. What you do is you put the bridge of your hand under a person's nose and you push up. And what that does is it causes them so much pain that they, they give up. 
Or as you're pushing up, they just bring their head up a little bit more and they bite your finger and leave a scar just like that one. So that's so what happened. It was fun all in all. Uh, yeah, the next few days were kind of stressful. The guy tested positive for hepatitis and uh, so I waited to get the results on that. Turns out I was okay. But uh, yeah, that, so that was a, a, another little introduction to violence. And then when I was in college, I think I was, oh, I had to be 20 because it was right before graduating, like moving out kind of graduating. And I had been trying to uh, get money from a guy who had taken my chair. I sold him a chair, a lazy boy chair. And he lived off campus. I lived uh, in the uh, campus housing. I was a, I hate to say this, this is embarrassing, but I was one of the, uh, was it called uh, dorm assistants or DA or VA or BA or something like that uh, in the apartment complex assistant manager. I started, I don't know, something like that. Anyway, um, I sold my chair to this off campus guy. He never ended up paying me. He still had the chair. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay you. And he never did. And so finally, we went. I went with a, a couple friends of mine. Um, gosh, time that goes by. One of those friends is now, he is now a woman. And the other friend was a, a Arab guy. He ended up having a stroke and losing his ability to speak his negative tongue and had to, like, relearn it all. I just touched base with his brother, who's a more casual friend also recently. Uh, oh, yeah. Eh, memories are fun. Anyway, those two big guys went with me over to uh, Gary's house to collect the chair. So we got the chair. There was no violence. And I brought it back to, to my apartment to dispose of it, however else. And then Gary comes over a few days later, because evidently his check from his dad had arrived. And he wanted to cash it so that he could go out and buy beer but it was made out to me. So I needed to go cash it and give him the cash. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I recall when he came over and we we're having this argument, it was out in the parking lot of the apartments, the college apartments at Central Wyoming College in Riverton. And uh, we're out there and and he's like, he's ready to fight. And he, when he got ready, I, I think I took my glasses off because I knew he was going to. And I am, I am, you know, like literally on my way within a week to uh, Southern California to get my start in law enforcement. And I couldn't get in fights. Like you get in a fight, you're not getting a job as a cop. Um, so I, I couldn't get in a fight. And, and plus I was a little bit of a, a coward at that point, kind of like now. And I recall he slaps me across the face so hard. Boom. My head goes around and I come back and I just keep grinning at him, Gary, I'm not going to give you the, the money. I'm not going to go cash the check and give you the money. I'm not going to do it. He slaps me again. Well, evidently, he'd been yelling and cussing enough that pretty soon thereafter, we looked over and we saw the, the cop lights coming. Somebody had called the cops. And we, you know, the cops, I said, yeah, I don't need to press charges. Just, yeah, we're, we're all good. It's all good. And so I didn't want to be a snitch or a rat bastard or anything like that. And uh, so... That was that was that, but that was a that was a weird circumstance of me having to just kind of uh, because I wanted a job, not having choosing to play the pacifist role and just take a hit and take another hit and just turn my cheek and come back for more and not lash out and just stay nice and calm. Uh, so that was a that was a violent incident. It's interesting. It turns out when I tested at the LAPD within three four months of that. Um, I got 100% on my oral board exam, which was very rare, um, but I got 100% on it. And I think me telling that story about what Gary did and how I handled it, I think that got me a lot of extra points. Uh, so it eh, kind of worked to my benefit. Uh, my skin color didn't, so I didn't get the job. I didn't have a high enough score at 100%, but we might get to racism in a little bit. I already discussed that in a previous video, but maybe I'll discuss it again since. There's a chance that not everybody who's watching this, maybe you haven't seen all of my videos. So maybe I'll repeat that. I sure certainly wouldn't expect you to have seen everything I've done. Let me think if there's anything else with violence that uh, really stands out. You know, I guess my career, uh, almost 10 years as a cop, uh, a few years in the jail, two years in Southern California in the sixth largest jail system in the country in a medium security jail, I saw some violence there. Uh, and I guess it was 
too numerous to mention all of the times, but yeah, I, I saw some violence. I didn't see anybody die or anything like that, but just, yeah, some fights, some tussles, some, you know, deputies taking somebody into the hallway and beating them because they'd flushed the toilet and that was against the rules, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I saw that, or I heard that. I was very nearby and knew what was going on. Um, so yeah, there, there were some, some violent things there. And then in the rest of my career as a street cop and detective, I, I came across and heard of and knew of some other things that happened. Uh, I think I came to have a very strong bias uh, through all the experiences I've talked about with violence. Uh, I, I really came to have a strong bias against the initiation of violence. Um, and, and at this point, I wasn't a voluntarist. I still thought, well, if a cop does it, it's okay. You know, that's that's not really violence. That's That's legal. You're doing what you have to do. And sometimes you have to push the limits a little bit, but it's it's okay. That's not really violence. It's legal. <laughs> if it's legal, it can't be violence, right? That's what I believed at the time. And of course, now I know that's ridiculous. That's not true or, or honest or, or good. I, I, I know that now. Um, other violent things. You know, I, I took a number of lessons and participated in... in uh, self-defense slash violent stuff, uh, some Chinese Kempo, uh, the Taekwondo when I was a kid, but that didn't really count. That was more of a sport thing. Um, some kind of, you know, cops only come and let's do martial arts. The one hardcore dude would teach it. Some things like that in Southern California. And, and then some, uh, some boxing from, uh, from a former, boxer in a uh, professional boxer uh when i moved to the the rocky mountain area i remember for a while when i worked in the rocky mountain area we had this uh this little thing we would do after work a few of us we'd go down and we'd spar or fight we'd usually go at 20 or 50 percent full force called ourselves a swinging swine but just to kind of keep our our skills sharp and you know take some hits and know that we could handle a punch but it wasn't full force um, so there was, there was that, a few other martial arts things and, you know, trainings, law enforcement trainings, custody and control and riot control and how to use a baton and pepper spray and a coup baton and, uh, those kinds of things. So I had a lot of training experience in, in that kind of stuff. Uh, but still to this day, I have never gone fist to cuffs without having a shiny brooch on my costume to, you know, carry that big heavy badge and therefore I'm going to be right and a radio to get my buddies to come help me. I have never just mono e mono gone up against another dude intent on hurting me and then we went at it or something. I, I've never done that. Um, I, I don't think I would have ever done well. Now as old and fat and weak as I am, um, I, I think I'd try throwing one punch and I'd be like, oh, my shoulder and oh, I pulled up straight. Like I, I wouldn't do well. Um, <laughs> I don't think I would. I I don't think that those few little skills that I, I learned but didn't practice hardcore, I don't think they would come back and serve me well. I, I think I'd be in trouble. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't had real fisticuffs, knock down, drag outs uh, with anybody. Uh, yeah, never never had that. So I think that kind of, uh, for now anyway, that, that wraps up my experience with violence and, and the, the things that might have led to me having certain biases one way or another. Let's talk uh, religious biases, spiritual religious biases. As I mentioned earlier, I was reared in the back hills of Tennessee in a Mennonite community for the most most part. And there were times we would go to other churches, other sex, cults, whatever you want to call them. But most of the time, it was the the Mennonite area. Everything from Holderman to Old Order Mennonite to uh, there's some black bumper Mennonites who live nearby, and, and there are a few others. What my overall, I don't know, I guess age two until 14, 15, maybe even 16, there was no real questioning. It was just, there was obviously a God, or, you know, we wouldn't be going to all these churches. 
Um, I was very devout uh, for a period. I think at age 13 or 14, I got saved, which is what uh, Southern Baptist folks do. You go up on an altar call to a cool song like um, Softly and Tenderly. You know, that's playing. It's called Altar Call. And then and, and the preacher's up there and he's saying that those of you who have sinned, it's not too late how to come forward and give your souls, how to give your hearts to Jesus. And they'd be preaching and doing their thing and then you'd go up. Well, I did that at age 13 or 14 and I went up and I, and I got saved. And then I had some uh, some negative things that I noticed about Christians as years went by. And I still just thought, you know, those are the individuals. It's not their religion. The religion itself is is just fine. Um, I, I do recall for a while I was just, I, I wouldn't like pray officially, but I just, I felt I was communicating with a higher power just by existing. And, and I would just think positive, good thoughts. And, and I remember getting chewed out by one of the elders and like, you should have worn a path up that hillside and where you get down on your knees and pray to God every day and, and just chewing me out for, for praying wrong. And so there were some negative things like that. Um, but I also saw a, a faith healing, this guy who had been in a car wreck uh, years before and had his leg all bummed up. He'd been limping for years and years and years. Everybody around the area knew him. I didn't, but everybody else did. And we're at this, I think at that point, it was an Assembly of God church. And they were doing the whole Adam and Shandaya, and I is what they I think they said something like that. I was talking in tongues, and there were people waving their hands in the air and running around the building and doing all kinds of, of cool Assembly of God stuff. And uh, this one guy, the preacher, went up there and laid hands on him and prayed on him, and and I'll be doggone if the guy didn't jump up and start running around without a limp. And so that was proof positive to all of us there that he had been he had been healed. Uh, a preacher asked God to do it, and God did it, and we saw it before our very eyes, and therefore it's all true. And so that was kind of what I lived around. I can't think of anybody who would have been an atheist at that at that juncture, uh, up to that age. I mean, even if you weren't really into it, you were, of course you were a Christian. You lived in the South, and, and did, of course you were a Christian, because you, even if you didn't love God and you were a backseat Christian or a, a spare tire Christian, they'd call them, where you just keep God as a spare tire, but you don't really have faith and believe and go to church. Uh, even if you were that kind, you still believed. So I didn't really have any exposure to anything else at that point. Uh, and I think it wasn't until I was in college, junior college, that I had a teacher who taught uh, in, uh, women's studies or something like that. And then I thought she, I think she also taught um, introduction to religion or something like that. And she was certainly not like the people who I had been reared around. And I don't, her wife wasn't either. And they were not conservatives. And I guess it was probably that 1994, 95 version of wokeism today. That's what I got a good dose of. Part of that was learning that there are a lot of different religions, that the the story of Jonah in the belly of the whale, a lot of different religions have a, a a tale, a parable, something like that, about one of the the characters going into a chasm or a hole or the belly of a well or a cave or whatever, and then having some transformation. And and I kind of learned that, wait a minute, this Bible-thumping, fire and brimstone stuff I'd been reared around, maybe there was something else out there. And that began my investigation, my loss of faith. I think that's when I started to turn, give up the faith, and I went for the reason, the logic, the science. And I think that was the big turning point, right around age 18, 19, 20. I think that's when I took... Uh, took the transition, made the transition. I would say that I was at that point agnostic. Um, and I think it was a lack of guts or balls saying that. Um, I think I was just saying that because it didn't cause arguments like being an atheist would have. Uh, and then I think around age 21 or so, I read Atlas Shrugged. And of course, Ayn Rand was an atheist. And so I was introduced to that. But I'm, I'm still around that early 20s range. I'm still thinking I'm an agnostic. 
And then years later, I thought, well, I need to be intellectually honest about this. I need to really look into this. Where do I stand? What, what, what do I know? What, what can I put together? What's my best conclusion? And the conclusion that I came up with some years ago was atheism. Um, and I'm, uh, what's it called, an agnostic atheist? I need to rewatch that awesome thing that Patrick Smith did. I might even insert it here if I can find it. So anyway, I, I, I kind of, I admit, I don't know. There could be a God. I just haven't seen any evidence of one or more gods. And until I do, I'm not going to believe it. But I'm very happy to. Um, I just, I, I, I don't know, and I've seen no evidence, so there's no reason to believe in that. And same thing goes for what Christians hate to hear this. They say it's all tired and worn out, but I don't think it's ever been refuted. The flying spaghetti monster, or Eric the... Magic Penguin, um, the Flying Spaghetti Monster. I have seen no evidence of uh, the Flying Spaghetti Monster. And if you can provide any of this evidence, then, oh, okay, I'll change my mind on a religion. But I, I haven't heard any, a single piece of, of real you know, quality evidence. Uh, I, I've just never heard anything. So at this point, I remain unconvinced and heavily leaning toward, eh, I don't think there is. I'm pretty sure there isn't, unless you can provide some proof. Uh, kind of like I think that the the trees, the tree leaves are green, and then the aspens, aspen leaves usually turn yellow in the fall, and the trunks are kind of white. I, I, I've seen this. This is what I believe. I have no reason to believe otherwise. If you have some evidence that the leaves actually turn red instead of yellow, then I'm open to hearing that, but I really think those are the mountain oaks you're thinking of, but, but I've opened to any evidence otherwise. So that's kind of been my, my journey, uh, my bias toward religion, and, and I guess where I've ended up. And so thus far, I've talked about a number of things. I've talked about poverty. I've talked about money. Uh, I've talked about religion, lastly. Uh, I've talked about violence. Um, I, I think, I guess there, you know, we could go with 50 other areas of life or one or whatever, but I, I guess I could mention family structure. Um, I am not, or, or just how, how families are, how they interact with each other, what's the proper uh, family structure, social structure. I, again, was reared by a single mother. She married at, I think, 20-ish to her first husband and wanted to have kids. He said he didn't want to have any kids right from the beginning. But she, I'm not going to say like many women, but she thought she could change him. And by age 30, it was very clear that she couldn't. And they divorced. He got everything. She's like, I'm just so sad. I want to get out of this. And so he took all the money and let her out of it. Um, gosh, including something like a 13-unit apartment complex in Southern California and a couple homes. They had been doing some investing. 
Uh, yeah, so that was all gone, but we did get a really nice frying pan that I grew up with that she got from that split up. But anyway, um, so th there was that split up, and then she was single until age 36, I think it was, and then she had told herself, you know, if I can't find a good husband by then, um, then I'm just, I'm going to have a kid. And I'm not sure why she couldn't find a good husband. Uh, she was second runner-up Miss Los Angeles beauty pageant at one point. She had a macrame studio in Laguna Beach, um, so she was kind of a businesswoman at that point. Uh, you know, not, not large scale, but she kind of had it going on, and I'm really surprised that she didn't find a guy at that point. But for whatever reason, maybe she was psycho. I don't know. A lot of guys claim that a lot of women are psycho. Maybe she was a psycho. I didn't think so, because she's my mom. She's my mom. So obviously she wasn't, but who knows? Um, so then she she finds the guy to be the uh, the sperm donor, and they date for a while, and she tells him she's got it covered, that she's on the pill or whatever, and she wasn't, and he injected her, and uh, here I came along uh, later, and when I was born, she called him from the hospital and basically said, hey, uh, you just had a a little baby boy born here. We're in National City. Uh, just, had, just had this baby born. And he says, uh, he says, oh, he says, I can't get there. He says, you know, I'm in Encinitas or wherever. He was, I think, 15 miles away. Uh, so there's no way he could get there. Uh, this was in 1973. Uh, so I, I guess they didn't have taxi cabs or bicycles or walking or whatever it was, but he, he just wasn't interested. So it wasn't until age 20 that I looked him up. I found him and sent a letter to him saying, hey, I think I might be your son. And then he responded with great, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm here for you. And I'm so glad you reached out. And absolutely. And, you know, you just finished getting your under, not undergraduate. I think at that point I was uh, in junior college. You just finished that up. And I've got some big stuff on the plate right now. And when this comes through, I'm going to have tons of money. And I've got the rest of your education. and." And I'll take good care of you. And I always thought it was a really cool, uh, cool kind of second meeting or I guess first meeting, but 20 years after I'd been alive. So that was, that was kind of my growing up thing was my mom was single the whole time. And around us were Mennonite families for the most part. And Mennonites don't get divorced. You know, if, if he's beating her or whatever, she needs to, well, we shouldn't know that's happening inside their home. Nobody else would know. Uh, so Mennonites just, they never were very rarely divorced. Now there were a couple that did, but for the most part, they just don't. Uh, I recall mom talking about sitting on the, the couch. If we would go to a, uh, Mennonite family's place after church or whatever for lunch or dinner or whatever, uh, we're in the living room and the, the man is sitting on the couch. The first couple times she messed up until she learned this was wrong, but he'd be sitting on one end of the couch. And she would sit on the far end with three, four feet between them. And that made her a hussy in the eyes of the Mennonite women. Like, you know, how dare you flirt with my husband like that, sitting so close? It just didn't even dawn on her um, that, well, wait a minute. If I'd sat right next to him and put my hand on his thigh, that would be flirting, but not at the opposite end of the couch. But that was considered inappropriate in Mennonite land. Um, so I... I you know, had that experience. Um, and I, we knew some people who were Southern Baptists or Seventh-day Adventists or just a few other worldly people. And there were, we, I knew that divorces happened. Um, and yeah, I, I knew that split-ups happened. I, I knew that gay people existed. I don't know at what age I first found that out. But I recall my mom was a very, I wouldn't say tolerant. Uh, I would just say indifferent. Like, she didn't care what somebody else was. I don't care if you're black. If you're black, it doesn't make you less or worse. As a matter of fact, in our area, um, it was dangerous to be black. Back in our neck of the woods, in our hillbilly hollers, it wasn't a place for black people to be. And mom actually demonstrated to me that she would reach out when somebody was lost there and see them to a safe place. And more about that later. I th you might have already watched that in the video I did on racism my experiences with it. Um, but yeah, very open-minded about that. And gay was just fine. Like, didn't really care. I think she'd tell me about uh, 
you know, somebody they knew, she and her first husband, uh, Bruce, uh, somebody that, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know why, that's cool. Just ignore it and keep going. Uh, if you don't know that that's the, the one name that people use to most frequently associate. Anyway, her husband, Bruce, and who was a high school teacher, they had some friends who were gay. And uh, I remember she would talk about them. And it was just completely normal and okay. It was just, oh, yeah, different people do do different things. So I didn't really have a negative idea of that. Um, I don't think there were any polyamorous in our community that I was aware of. Um, so I didn't, didn't know about that. There was certainly nothing in my life until, I don't know, age 30 or more that I even, it would enter my mind about a, a person transitioning genders or, or whatever. I, that just had never happened, uh, never came into my consciousness. So, uh, yeah, and then I, just as an adult, you know, I saw a lot of people getting divorced and you, you'd think it would last and it wouldn't. And, and, and yes, yeah, so I've experienced that. And I've been an ordained minister for a while and I've married some people and uh, at least one of them uh, has divorced. And uh, yeah, so I, I've kind of, I, I, I've seen that stuff happen. I, I've been in some circles with some people who, uh, shall we say, are more open uh, to lifestyles, and um, I'm somewhat knowledgeable about people who live in that world. Um, not incredibly knowledgeable, but I've, I've had exposure to it. Um, so I, I kind of know how those folks think. I know how conservatives think. I know how a number of different people think. And that's, I guess, my, my kind of my wrap-up of uh, relationships, marriages, how, how things ought to be in that way, and uh, what has formed my worldview, my bias in, in those areas. And so now, maybe you're thinking, so what? So what? Okay, you tell, told your life story broken up into these different segments. So what? Well, now, how have those things influenced me? How have they uh, changed my life, changed the direction that I've chosen to build my life or the things that have happened to me? So we'll start with poverty. Um, I think largely in part due to the way I was reared, I, I knew I didn't want that. I didn't want to be poor. I knew how much that hurt down deep. And I think that one experience of the people condescending us when we were moving into their free uh, abandoned house they were going to let us live in, that feeling is uh, not something that I ever wanted to experience again. And to this day, um, I give gifts, but I have such a hard time accepting gifts. Um, if, if, I took, if I took Elon Musk to lunch tomorrow and the bill came, I would likely pick it up and say, I've got this. And I think that's because of my bias. That's because of my life experience. I'm trying to make up. This is, this is psychology. Somebody mentioned they wanted to hear about some psychology. Here's some psychology. Uh, in the poll that I asked uh, that you do uh, recently in the comments of YouTube, somebody mentioned that they'd like to see some, some content on psychology. This is psychology. This is me being open and vulnerable. I think that the reason that I have so much problems, so many problems, <laughs> being loved, being letting people give me anything that's not earned uh, is because of some of those poverty experiences as a kid. So yeah, um, Elon Musk tries to buy me lunch. I, I've got it covered. I just want to show that I can. Um, if he paid for my lunch, I might do what I did yesterday. So yesterday, I'm coming through Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, actually, it was the night before, because yesterday I drove from Flagstaff. So it was the night before. I went next door to my hotel to a Mexican restaurant and uh, I'm trying to be adventurous. And my wife is so adventurous with foods and, and life and experiences. And I'm trying to be more like her instead of just being the same old boring guy. So I'm at this restaurant and I say to myself, I say, self, I'm not going to get my same old, same old trying to relive my mom's uh, cheese enchiladas. Uh, I'm not going to try to relive that. I'm not going to do my normal shredded beef uh, enchilada with no sauce on top. Uh, I'm going to, you know, spread my wings and do something else. And so 
the nice server says that she likes chipotle chicken. Their, their dish is really good. And, and I thought I remembered not liking chipotle, but I'm like, you know what? I'm doing this. And so she brings me the chipotle chicken dish proudly and sets it down and walks away. And I have one bite of that salt. Some people might call it chipotle, but what I had was this tart, salty sauce. No, it wasn't going to happen. So I had one bite. But there were rice and beans, and there were some tortillas there. So I ate the rice and beans and tortillas. She asked me how it was. The server came around. She said, oh, how was it? And I said, you know what? I, I guess now I know I really don't like Chipotle, but thank you. It's, I'm sure it's cooked beautifully and perfectly, and I am all good. No problems. And she said, well, let me trade it out for something else. I said, no. I, I ordered it. Like, your business is out a chicken breast and some Chipotle sauce and like eight pounds of salt, I'm guessing. Um, but you guys are out this, of course I'm gonna pay for it. Like that was my fault to order the wrong thing. It's not like, not like I ordered something that should have been done right and you did it wrong. That's not the case at all. Like, no, this is on me, man. I'm, it's all good. I'm enjoying my beans and rice and tortillas. And so I, I continued eating that. She brings me the bill at the end and it's for six bucks. It's for my beer. And the, the meal is written off. And I said, no, no, I, I'm insisting on this. I'm going to pay you. Um, no, th this is not okay. I ordered it. I knew I probably wouldn't care for it. It was my risk to take. And she's like, no, you're not paying for something you didn't eat and enjoy at this restaurant. I'm like, okay, I, she's right. That's good. That's a good hotel. Or not a hotel. That's a good restaurant um, to have that kind of attitude to teach their employees that. Man, oh man, what a great owner of that restaurant to have that policy. Awesome. Love it. Okay, so the bill is six bucks. It should have been $21. So my tip should have been, I give over 20, 20 to 25%. So it should have been a, a $5 tip on top of 21-ish bucks. So that would have brought it to 26 bucks, but I just rounded it up to 30. And so I left a 20 and two fives along with the bill on the table, and left the restaurant. Would I have done that had I been reared with money? Had I not been raised, reared, I'm sorry, that's poor, horrible grammar to say I was raised a certain way. If I had been reared with money, would I have known, known to do what I did? Would, would I have made that choice? I, I think I've got this chip on my shoulder that made me want to prove, no, I am never ever the one that pays less. I am always the one who pays my fair share. Nobody ever helps me with a single freaking penny. Not that it's like something I'm emotional about or anything, but nobody ever helps me out. Um, now, a gratuity in my, in, in my work, if I do a good job and somebody gives me a few hundred bucks as a gratuity, I'll accept it. Um, but that's that's not a a charity thing. That's not, oh, I feel sorry for you, let me help you out thing. That's not it at all. Um, so yeah, I, I wonder if, if if some of my thinking now might be based, it might be my psychological response to being reared in a poverty-stricken environment. Now, I don't help people. Let me rephrase that. I do help people. I think about the poor guys who really suck at making a living and they just want, you know, if I had a car or a phone, I could get a job and blah, blah, blah. I will not give a penny to those folks. But you know what I will do? I will spend a lot of time and headache writing a book and then publishing it. The title of the book is Harsh Advice for the Unemployed Guy. I am more than willing to donate my effort my time and money to create this book. I'm not making money on it. <laughs> Even if it sold a copy or two, I still wouldn't make money on it. Um, I did that because I want to help other people. So I guess I do have a, a desire to help others, but I don't think that giving poor people money is going to solve their problem. If you had given my mom $10,000 or a million dollars, that wouldn't have solved the issue that she wasn't willing to go out and be productive and produce something of value for people who are willing to exchange money. That wouldn't have changed that. Uh, either which way, she was going to be there for me when I left for school and she was going to be there when I got home. 
and she was going to be an awesome mother and just just an incredible mother, other than maybe setting the example of being a, a hardworking entrepreneur. But other than that, awesome, awesome mother. So that's kind of a a little rundown on the the, the financial part. Now I I chose a spouse who is very good at at, at business, at home economics, at, at finances. Uh, she's very good at at earning money and keeping money and investing money and so now we're we're doing well we're comfortable now we're not you know really 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 rich but we're doing okay and I'm I'm comfortable at this point and you know it's okay if if we have a ten thousand dollar problem come up we can pay it and it's not gonna mess up our life we're not gonna have to go into debt or something to deal with it um, so so we're comfortable and I, and I don't know that I would be if I'd been reared around plenty of money, I don't. I think I would have taken it for granted. I wouldn't have realized how important it is to have a, a backup plan to a backup plan to a backup plan. Um, so I think that's that's actually helped me a lot. Those, those experiences in poverty have helped me a lot. So what was the the next issue that I I chatted about? I think it was it was violence. So how did things turn out with violence? Well, it turns out now I'm not a pacifist uh, in, in any way. However, my experiences with violence have led me to become a humanitarian. Some people call it voluntarism. Some people call it humanitarianism. Uh, some people call it ANCAP, I, I, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I don't think it's okay to initiate violence against other people. And I'm consistent about that. I don't make exceptions. I don't make exceptions for, well, it's okay if it's a priest or a, a, a politician or a, a policeman or somebody like that. Well, then it's okay. No, I, I am now a consistent, uh, philosophically consistent person who is opposed to initiating violence against other people. Um, I'm opposed to that. And maybe I wouldn't be had I not had all of my life experiences. But that has led me to have this certain, all my life experiences have led me to have this certain bias against the initiation of force, the initiation of violence. And I think that served me well. I think it's helped me arrive at a philosophical conclusion that makes a lot of sense and is, uh, is, is a really pretty sound one. And uh, of course, you know, if you listen to my other videos, watch them about voluntarism. If you read one of my books, uh, Anarchy Exposed. If you read Larkin Rose's Most Dangerous Superstition. If you read some Murray Rothbard books. If you read some Lysander Spooner. There, there are lots of ways of, of getting this information. If you want to get a bunch of bits of information in one thing, then read Keith Knight's book, um, Voluntarism. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure of the title of it, but if you look up Keith Knight in Amazon and voluntarism, it'll pop up. Or voluntarist, I'm not sure. It'll pop up. And it's a great compilation of works. Many of the things that I had read before, uh, it's, a, it's a great book. And yes, I wrote one little tiny piece of it. So maybe I'm biased there, speaking of bias, but well worth picking up. What's the next thing? You know, when we talk, when I talked about religion, um, I think I did full circle on that at, at the time. I'm, I'm currently an atheist with an open mind um, to any evidence, to any logic that's, that's presented. Yep, still open to that. Um, I think the final thing that I talked about after violence was relationships and how I feel now, how I think now about those kinds of things. Um, and my feelings are very different than my thinkings. Um, the, the ultimate way that I think is correct, acceptable, okay for human beings to have interpersonal relationships, families, spouses, etc. Um, what I think is right and acceptable and preferable, I kind of have to set aside because of the psychological issues that humans have. So 
I am not opposed to polyamory. However, I think it's very difficult if either of the people, <laughs> either, I guess poly would mean that either wouldn't be the right word. Any of the people in a polyamorous, polyamorous relationship have been exposed to religions that are opposed to polyamory. If they've been exposed to society in general, um, is this your wife? Somebody asks instead of, is this one of your wives? Or, or if a, a woman introduces her husband, somebody wouldn't say in, in U.S. normal society, the woman introduces her husband, they wouldn't say, oh, uh, is your other husband not here? Like just, huh, what? It's just kind of an abnormal thing. So if anybody involved in any relationship has had any exposure, like I've had heavy exposure, if anybody has, has, has had that exposure to the societal norms, even though they shouldn't be influenced by those, they are. And I, I wouldn't advise the young person who says, hey, I, I I'm, don't really have a preference for men or women. I don't really have a preference for how many people I have a relationship with. Um, and I'm trying to decide if I want to marry or, or commit myself to two guys and two gals or just one guy or just one gal or one guy and one gal. Or I, I, I'm not really sure what to do. I don't know if the commitment should be for as long as we both are mutually benefiting from it, or if it should be forever, ever more, like that'd be a stupid contract, but I don't know what would be the right thing to do. Well, I would almost have to give the advice to this young person to go along with the societal norms, even though I don't think they're right, because I know that some of the parties are gonna have issues if they don't go along with the societal norms. And this is a tough one. I'm actually partway through a book on this, Libertarian Relationships. I don't know that I'll ever finish it. There's a, there, there are a lot of thoughts and, and people in there who would know who I was talking about. And I don't know, maybe it'll be something that uh, comes out after I'm dead. So y'all might have to wait five or ten years for that. But uh, yeah, it's, my, my upbringing has certainly influenced that side of things. Do I care if other people are uh, gay, bi, uh, trans, whatever? I don't, I don't really care. It's none of my business, really. Um, one of my employees is actually a trans man, so woman transitioning to man. Uh, and he would like me to call him a him. He, he hasn't said so outright. But I know he's interested in that movement, and he lives in the Philippines, and it's a, uh, I don't know, it's, it's culturally inappropriate there, just like it is in the United States. It's not an accepted thing. And I think that this employee is, is uh, not on the same page as I am about things, is a bit woker about stuff than I am. And then I think, well, I know what this person's preference is, it's not like I have a classroom of students. It's not like my employee is telling me, you must call me by my preferred pronoun. But I just think, what should I call her, him, it, they? I, I don't know. And I think, you know what? This employee is doing a good job. It has, isn't bringing up the issue with, issue with me. Isn't pushing stuff. Uh, it says it's, it's a gal transitioning to guy, so evidently wants to be a guy. So I call him him. Uh, if he ever insisted upon it, I think I would turn foul and call her a her because of chromosomes and that kind of stuff. Like, I know what reason and science is, but I'm also willing to give some grace on that kind of thing. Um, I don't really care if my friends are gay or straight or bi or polyamorous or uh, monosexuals or uh, monogamous male, female. I don't care about any of that gender or sex stuff. Uh, some of it's interesting. It's like, holy cow, you are? Really? Whoa, well, that's different. Like, okay, but that would be just kind of like a, uh, I don't know, somebody saying, I read a really cool book. Oh, really? What's that about? It, like, okay, whatever. I don't deep down care about that stuff. So those are just uh, some areas of my life, some of the biases, some of my background, some of the reasons that when you hear things now, when I put out a, a podcast or a video, 
And you're thinking, huh, I wonder what, oh, I'll bet you that one experience he talked about has led him to believe the way that he believes. And I'm, of course, open to argument. And uh, if I got some things wrong here, eh, correct me, as always. Uh, there, there's no, I don't know how long this video is, but it's over half an hour. And I can only go about 18 to 34 seconds without making some sort of a mistake. So when you catch all the mistakes I've made, please feel welcome. Uh, please feel encouraged. Please feel begged to correct me. Correct me in the comments. Uh, if you want to come on and argue with me, let's have a let's have a debate. And I'm not tech savvy enough to do it live, but we'll we'll do a, a Zoom interview, and I'll be fair to you. And uh, yeah, we'll put it out there. I I'm always open to to feedback and criticism and suggestions and uh, being proven that I'm wrong about stuff. Hopefully, this video has been of some use to you. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, subscribing would be really neat for me. Subscribing and then if you think somebody else, one of your friends would enjoy this, uh, if you think of which one would, send it to that person and uh, I I'd appreciate that. That would help this channel grow.